Thank you guys so much for coming out. It's really good to see a lot of familiar faces. <laughs> Andrea Shoup, and this is Wesley Hine, also known as Cousin Bones. Tell me right now. <laughs> Um, I'm starting a podcast, so any donations that I get tonight will go to hosting fees for that. Um, I look forward to seeing I recorded the first episode. It's um, I recorded Josh Gaines. He's a local what? poet, so what? it's really awesome. And keep look out. Um, I think it's going to be called The Mad Ones. I'm debating the title, but I'll post it on Facebook soon. called Chicago. You think she belongs to you the same as I once did when I took her for granted, using her to believe in and build myself selfishly in her presence. She belongs to whoever fights for her, takes her changing winds, empty stares, accepts her past along with ridiculous hope. Get lost in her. There's no other way to really feel her. She speaks so many languages, words are lost at times, as imaginary to you as symbols and advanced mathematics courses. So many different routes to take to a destination that's unclear. Her rules and expectations at best will push you, at worst wear on you, until everything you knew is lost. There's a rotation of lovers, but you ask to be here. So when she's untouchable, stay. Don't ask her to submit to you. You're not even equals, and you know it. She wants a revolutionary, a wanderer, creator, but she lets you be here, and doesn't ask for you to be anything other than what you are today. And when she looks back at you, whispers the truth, glows softly for no one but you, you know there's nothing better out there, not in this moment. This one's called Birds. Ten thousand black wings speckled red fell from the Arkansas sky just after the new year began. Some called it an omen, the beginning of the end. You just made a joke comparing the blackbirds to test subjects from an experiment to discover if people have the ability to see into the future. The people reportedly blacked out as you expected the birds had, signs of hemorrhaging in their small, dark bodies. They saw the future, you laughed as we lay naked and get apart. The birds' bodies hit some undeniable power in the darkened sky, some knowingness hidden from us, small intricate bodies slamming into whatever our subconscious desires to imagine, then falling into our reality as a document of our dreams, a sign of possible awe. We've both been transfixed on the future for months, haven't we? Each one of us alone in this new, frozen city, hoping to find some kind of justification for our lives here. And I still refuse to believe in some apocalyptic curse of death building through the world we poisoned so long. Nice. nice. Yeah. This one's called Fever. 
sort of during the heat wave last summer. Getting excited about those again. <laughs> it's so damn hot, none of the choices in fit in life fit right, and I never should have fell in love. We're too fucked up and it's like looking in an emotional mirror. I've been laying in my bed, masturbating for days, sweaty in this heat, and the world feels like a fever desperately in need of breaking. I'm trying to figure out what I need. I need to write. I need money. I need a job. I need groceries. I need a fucking couch. I need to live in an apartment without mice and gunshots. I need to figure out how to start my life because I'm trapped. I need therapy to calm my nerves about my mistakes. I need to go to the gym and watch Rocky run. I need to call my parents, tell them not to worry, explain why I can't move someplace easier because my dreams don't exist there. I need to find a way they can hear that. And I need whoever is letting Satan control the weather with another day above 100 degrees to fuck off. I need to put the window I see incorrectly, not just taping the side parts. I need to shower. I need to do the chores like hang my mirror, the signal faith I'm going to make it here. I need to learn heartache is like fuel when everything is going wrong, like daydreams and plans no one understands but you. I need this fever to break and remember this is still where I belong. Oh. Woo! Um, this is a two-parter. It's called uh, Bathtub Audio Recordings. <laughs> oh, yes! Oh, yes! <laughs> I want to start making bathtub audio recordings. There's no place more honest than a bathtub. There, I have relief. I'd like my grandchildren to find the tapes, reading poetry aloud as the faucet offers purity. I think about how they say being surrounded by water feels like the inside of a womb. That's why you feel safe there, too. We, squeed in, we squeezed into a tiny bathtub together once. I wasn't supposed to be there, and you lied about the bubbles. The hilarity of trying to make it sexy was probably the most honest moment we've shared. And in my laughter, I found relief. Your, mi your miniature battleships lined the tub, and again, I wished you were someone I knew, even after all of this. Because the way I, I know you is not like people really know each other. Not really. I tell my grandchildren about you in my tapes, but briefly. This is part two. I think about the first date. I felt so trapped inside. You let me walk with you in the cold, coffee in hand. The boulevards were quiet that night as cars went by. We sat, watched, talked poetry. The cars weren't people in cars, just cars. There was no one but you even if I wasn't sure yet. The third date, same night, me almost crying about high school funerals, how the city never seems to embrace me back. And the green mill wasn't green at all, it was red, alive yet soft, timeless as always. I found relief that night in your bed, pretending, pretending to be someone who allowed themselves to be vulnerable. Your eyes looked like they were watching lips praying as I spread my legs. I didn't want those eyes to change, begging them to stay that way, focused yet soft, though the words were something different. And maybe that's how we fell in love, and why you surround me like a warm bath, even apart for nights. It grows colder, but there's still relief. I want to tell my grandchildren what our Memphis love note said, that napkin hidden between old brothel bricks. Keep your heart open. And I want to tell my grandchildren there will be many yous. None of them really matter. Once your head is underwater, there will be relief. This is untitled right now. Allow me to be the image of a girl, not a woman, strong atop your sheets, a manifestation of what you cannot yet reach. I'll be memories of patterns in your mother's apron, pretty girls upright in stiff desks whose eyes never met yours, faceless young women tasting of college town whiskey and almost settled regret. Let me be what you almost see in a kaleidoscope of unsurfaced hope. Just don't let me be the one whose words never rose above a whisper lost beneath a moan, 
who, whose mistakes were for nothing more than to mark another cyclic passage of time. We have grown apart. We walk on stages, write countless pages, but we've never captured the meaning here. There are lines to grant our ghosts as I watch them writhe in passion, reaching through parallels in time, never to touch, that for which we selfishly reached through each other to grasp ourselves. Passion has a way of suffocating. We scraped the beauty off each other's skin, stored the dust of our bones for fantasies, but look so barren now, eye to eye, as our bodies begin to lie. one's New Mexico's son. I drove to the New Mexico sun, down that road, up your mountain, closer to the stars than I've ever been. I went to where my heart began. Sex and love, the confusion, reaching, th reaching through one in the other. I didn't want to be your friend, your future wife, Dreams of ripened grapes fermenting to gold, I wanted to be plucked. I needed to make that moment everything. I felt like a stranger in your bathroom, a spy in the house of where I couldn't stay. Toothpaste, the window, car gone. Sun, visible heat, brightest blue, widest sky. Long roads, changing elevations. Spirituality, that history, standing still. Spirits through Adobe's breathing, D.H. Lawrence's cabin estate, that feeling of fate. Leaving, I felt nothing good could last. Stranded in Oklahoma during a storm, I threw my voice back to you and said goodbye for the last time. Sleeping in a Motel 6 alone, submerged in thunder, I knew my mistake, not in coming, but in leaving. And I've been traveling alone still, even when I'm not. Not looking at maps, unable to trust anyone with such organizational skills and belief in foresight. I wander, fall, make messes, count my losses, find other places to escape into. But more than most others, I can picture the future our words danced around, Oregon evergreens, our vineyard, Crafted glasses of Pinot Noir, full aged, ready. It's actually two left now. This one's short. This is ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts? I asked him, conscious of not sounding as if I do one way or another. He stopped in front of me at the bar and stated, I grew up too poor to believe in ghosts. I imagined him as a child and my heart felt heavy. I thought of myself oppositely and my heart was still heavy. I've always had too much room for psychological fears. And I thought of a few weeks before creating a small makeshift Ouija board with a soon-to-be lover in a dim 4 a.m. bar glowing red with undeniable need. We placed our fingers lightly on the upside down shot glass, anticipation growing like childish excitement, and I asked if there were any spirits near. Nothing moved, even after a couple tries, a sign right then if we had been selfless enough to listen. I went to his place anyway, taught him my tricks and cast my spells, and I held that moment in my palm as a crystal ball, reflecting ourselves some magic to be learned. I left in the morning, and he became another future ghost of mine. Ghosts whispering, alternative people, alternative truths. Ghosts crusting the places so unreachable now. All right, this is the last one. Oh, but why? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is called Your Melancholy Horror. <laughs> I chose to write about you, my out-of-step dear, 
Because it was easier than writing about that stale studio of mirrors, I couldn't. The way you chose to feel my body another night, tangled in flesh and breath instead of missing her touch. After a year of intermittent sweat and words, dear, you couldn't love me because of another. The memory of her scent as you shacked up in San Francisco traveled through Fiji. It's weakened the response of your endorphins to any other's aromatic whispers. Such is the meaning behind the quote you shared. Sex is a consolation you have when you can't have love. Even after sipping bourbon cocktails, photo booth poses, brunch at Lula's. The same, dear, I could never love you, regardless of your lips' softness resting on my curves. But I never let on that you were just another place to hide. Just as those nearly forgotten white walls could not love me and never will. And through the nodding of the past, gifted floral sheets I laid, smelling of the messes we'd made. Fresh of him, I dreamt the sun would hide for us, even as the hours continued to pass. The way I slept with my urban cyclist as an escape, even after our daylight broke. My two-wheeled lover couldn't love me because of her, that stale odor hanging around his city still. And such, dear, are the reasons I made him say and do those filthy things to me, the way the frameless mattress wanted it to be, so I could feel it happening and know love can no longer hurt me here. and say, you're staying there. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give it up one more time. I mean it, Randy. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And keep in mind that if anybody, if you don't know anything about me from this open mic, if you have any poetry that you would like to submit to CCND Magazine, you can't remember all of that email stuff for remembering CCND96 at scars.tv or something, you can always mail it to Andrea Shoot for Chicago Pulse at gmail.com, which would be double plus awesome because I'm always looking for the local people and she's found people from all sorts of different places, including there was a Josh. It's one or two, I think I've got in there as well. So, um, thank you very much. And I had to write down, I need to live in an apartment without mice and gunfire. That's a beautiful line. And I was just like thinking, I'm like, I used to always be in an apartment in Logan Square, and I just like have a glass of wine up on the second floor of the back porch and watch the rats that were like a foot long with a foot long tail. I'm like. You're awesome. So that's what Chicago is. You have to love it, I swear to God. Uh, I'm going to be really, really brief and say something about our upcoming features because right now our website is not up, but it will be by Friday for her podcast, www.chaoticarts.org slash the cafe for the cafe gallery. Um, but in two weeks on May 8th, day after my wedding anniversary, I'm going to be here anyway. Give it up for Charlie Newman, who's going to be our feature then. Yeah, Charlie Newman. And two weeks after that on May 22nd, actually, we've got Kathleen Channel Meyer Bartle, so you never get to hear Kathleen as a feature, so give it up for Kathleen, round right out for that. June 5th has Robin Fine, which is so cool. Fine time! Fine time! Fine time! Fine time! Exactly, as CPA would always say. And then on June 19th, which is right before the summer solstice, Esteban Colon is our feature. So I've got like two bunch of awesome, awesome, awesome feature things. So I want everybody here, and I love all my newbies. Oh my God, I love you all so much. Please come here all the time. I double plus love you. If you need to bug me for email addresses or anything, they're gonna hold me. I would love it, and thank you all. Thank you guys, you're just, you, they're like, we're just gonna be in the front and be all hot and sexy in the front, but that's just how I roll, sorry. Um, anyway, Thank you all so very much. I look forward to seeing all of you in two weeks. And thank you.